I'm Mark. This is Ted. My school number is SO341013. Today I'm going to read Monica Lewinsky, The Price of Shame. You're, and I'm sophomore. You're looking at a woman who was publicly silent for a decade. Obviously, that's changed, but only recently. It was several months ago that I gave my very first major public talk at the four events, 30 on the 30 submit. 1,500 billion people, all under the age of 30. That meant that in 1998, the oldest among the group were only 14, and the youngest just four. I joked with them that some might only have heard of me from rap songs. Yes, I meant rap songs, almost 40 rap songs, laughter. But the night of my speech, a, surprise, a surprising thing happened. At the age of 41, I was hit on by a 27-year-old guy. I know, right? He was charming, and I, I was flattered, and I declined. You know what his unsuccessful pickup line was? He could, he could make me feel 22 again. Laughter. Applause. I realized later that night I'm probably the only person over 40 who does not want to be 22 again. Laughter. Applause. At the age of 22, I fell in love with my boss, and at the age of 24, I learned the devastating consequences. Can I see a show of hands of anyone here who didn't make a mistake or do something that they regretted at 22? Yep. That's what I thought, so like me at 22, a few of you may have also taken wrong turns and fallen in love with the wrong person, maybe even your boss, like me, though your boss, your boss probably wasn't the president of the United States of America, of course, life is full of surprises, not a day goes by that I'm not reminded of my mistake. And I regret that mistake deeply. In 1998, after having been swept up into an improbable romance, I was then swept up into the eyes of a public, legal, and media maelstrom like we had never seen before. Remember, just a few years earlier, News was consumed from just three places, reading a newspaper or a magazine, listening to the radio, or watching television. That was it, but that was, wasn't my fate. Instead, this scandal was brought to you by the digital revolution. That meant we could access all the information we wanted, when we wanted, anytime, anywhere, and when the story broke in, January 1998, it broke online. It was the first sign that traditional news was unsurped by the internet for a major news story. A click that re rever re reverberated around the world. What that meant for me personally was that overnight I went from being a completely private figure to a public humiliated one worldwide. I was patient zero of losing a personal reputation on a global scale almost instantaneously. This rush to judgment enabled by technology led to mobs of virtual stone throwers. Granted, it was before social media before but people could still com comment online email stories and of course email cruel jokes. Jokes. News sources plaster photos of me all over to sell newspapers, banner ads online, and to keep people tuned to the TV. Do you recall a pop partic particular image of me, say, wearing a beret? Now I admit I made mistakes, especially wearing that beret. But the attention and judgment that I received. Not the story, but that I personally received was some unprecedented. I was branded as a trend, tart, slut, whore, bimbo, or, and of course, that woman. 
I was seen by many but actually known by few, and I get it. It was easy to forget that that woman was dimensional, had a soul, and was once and broken. When this happened to me 17 years old ago, there was no name for it. Now we call it cyberbullying and online harassment. Today I want to share some of my experience with you. Talk about how that experience has helped me helped shape my cultural observations and how I hope my past experience can lead to a change that results in less suffering for all of us. In 1998, I lost my reputation and my dignity. I lost almost everything, and I almost lost my life. Let me paint a picture for you. It is September of 1998. I was I'm sitting in a windless, windowless office room inside office of the Independent Council underneath humming fluorescent lights. I'm listening to the sound of my voice, my voice on surreptitiously taped phone calls that a supposed friend had made the year before. I'm here because I've been legally required to personal authenticate all 20 hours of tape conversation. For the past eight months, the mysterious content content of these tips has hung like the sword of the Mokos over my head. I mean, who can remember what they say, what they said a year ago? Scared and mortified, I listen. Listen as I prattle on about the flawsome and jetsome of the day. Listen as I confess my love for the person and of, of course my heartbreak. Listen to my sometimes catty, sometimes churlish, sometimes silly self being cruel, unforgiven, uncalled. Listen deeply, deeply ashamed to the worst version of my, myself, a self I don't even recognize. <coughs> a few days later, the star report is released. <coughs> To Congress and all of those tapes and transcripts of stolen words. For a part of it that people can read the transcripts is horrific, horrific enough, but a few weeks later the audio tapes <coughs> are aired on TV and significant portions made available online. The pub public humiliation was excruciating. <coughs> Life was almost unbearable. This was not something that happened with regularity back then. <clears throat> and by this, I mean the sealing of people's private words, actions, Conversations or photos, and then making them public, public without consent, co public without context, and public without compassion. Fast forward 12 years to 2010, and now social media has been born. The landscape has sadly become much more populated with instances like mine. Whether or not someone actually make a mistake, and now is for both public and private people. The consequences for some have become dire, very dire. I was on the phone with my mom in September of 2010, and we were talking about the news of a young college freshman from Dresser University named Tyler Clement. Sweet, sensitive, creative Tyler was secretly welcomed by his roommate while being intimate with another man. When the online world learned of this incident, the ridicule and cyberbullying ignited. A few days later, Tyler jumped from the George Washington Bridge to his death. He was 18. 
My mom was beside herself about what happened to Tyler and his family, and she was guarded with pain in a way that I just couldn't quite understand. And then eventually, I realized she was relieving 1998, relieving the time when she sat by my bed every night, relieving the time when she made me shower with the bathroom door open, and relieving the time when both of our parents feared that would be humiliated to death, literally. Today, too many parents haven't had the chance to step in and rescue their loved ones. Too many have learned of their child's suffering and humiliation after it was too late. Tyler's tragic, senseless death was a turning point for me. It served to recontextualize my experience, and I then began to look at the world of humiliation and bullying around me to see something different. In 1998, we had no way of knowing where this brave new technology called the internet would take us. Since then, it it has connected people in unimaginable ways, joining lost siblings, saving lives, launching revolutions for the darkness, cyberbullying, and the slush shaming that I experienced at Mushroom. Every day online, people, especially young people who are not developmentally equipped to handle this, are so abused and humiliated that they can't imagine living to the next day, and some tragically don't, and there's nothing virtual about that. Childline, a UK nonprofit that's focused on Helping young people on various issues, released a staggering statistic that says from 2012 to 2013, there was an 87% increase in calls and emails related to cyberbullying. A meta-analysis done out of the Netherlands showed that for the first time, cyberbullying was leading to suicidal. I- ideations more significantly than offline bullying. And you know what shocked me, although it shouldn't have, was other research last year that determined humiliation was a more intensely felt emotion than either happiness or even anger. Cruelty to others is nothing new, but online technologically enhanced streaming is amplified, uncontained and permanently accessible. The echo of embarrassment used to extend only as far as your family, village, school, or community, but now it's the online community too. Millions of people, often anonymously, can stab you with your their words, and that's a lot of pain. And there are no parameters around how many people can publicly observe you and put you in that public stock. There is a very personal price to public humiliation, and the growth of the internet has jacked up that price. For nearly two decades now, we have slowly been sowing the seeds of shame and public humiliation in our cultural soil, both on and offline. Gossip websites, paparazzi, reality programming, pop politics, News outlets and sometimes hackers of traffic and shame. It's that desensitization and a permissive environment online which lets itself to trolling, invasion of privacy, and cyberbullying. This shift has created what Professor Nicholas Mills calls a cultural humiliation. Consider a few. Prominent example just from the past six months alone. Snapchat, the surface which is used mainly by younger generation and claims that the messages only have their lifespan in a few seconds. You can imagine the range of content that that gets. A third party app which Snapchatters use to preserve the lifespan of the message was hacked and t- 
One hundred thousand personal conversation photos and videos was leaked online to now have a lifespan of forever. Jennifer Lawrence and several other actors have their iCloud accounts hacked, and private intimate nude photos were plastered across the internet without their permission. One gossip website have over five million hits for this one story, and without and what about the sound and picture cyber hacking? The document which reserved the most attention were private emails that had maximum public and various value. But in this culture of humiliation, there is not the kind of press that attached the public shaming. The press is that measure the cost of the victim, which Tyler and too many other notable women, women, minorities and members of the LGBTQ community have paid. But the price measures the profit of those who prey on them. This invasion of others is a role material efficiently and ruthlessly in mind, packaged and sold at the profit. A um, marketplace has emerged where public accumulation is accompanied and shame is an industry. How is the money clicks? The more shame, the more clicks, the more clicks, the more advising dollars. We're in the dangerous cycle. The more you click on this kind of gossip, the more numb we we'll get to the human lives behind it. And the more numb we get, the more we click. All the while, someone is making money off of the back of someone else suffering. With every click, we make a choice. The more we saturate our culture with public shaming, the more accepted it is, the more we will see behavior like cyberbullying, trolling, some forms of the hacking, and online harassment. Why? Because they all have humiliation at their cores. This behavior is a symptom of the culture we've created. Just think about it. Changing behavior begins with evolving beliefs. We've seen that to be true with racism. Homophobia and plenty of other biases today and in the past. As we've changed beliefs about same-sex marriage, more people having offered equal freedoms. When we begin valuing sustainability, more people begin to recycle. So as far as our culture of humiliation goes, what we need is a cultural revolution. Public shaming as a blood sport has to stop in the sign for intervention on the internet and in our culture. The shift begins with something simple, but it's not easy. We need to return to a long held value of compassion, compassion and em empathy. Online, we've got a compassion deficit and empathy crisis. Researcher Renee Brown said, and I quote, Shame can survive empathy. Shame cannot survive empathy. I've seen some very dark days in my life, and there was a compassion and empathy for my family, friends, professionals, and sometimes even strangers that saved me. Even empathy from one person can make a difference. The theory of minority influence pros, prop, Proposed by social psychologist Sir Wozniacki, says that even in small numbers, when there is consistency over time, change can happen. In the online world, we can foster minority influence by becoming upstander. Upstanders. To become an upstander means instead of bystander apathy, we can post a positive comment for someone or report. A bullying situation. Trust me, compassionate common self about the negativity. We can also counteract the culture by supporting organizations that dealt with these kinds of issues, like the Tyler Clemente Foundation in the U.S. The U.S. There's anti-bullying pro, and in Australia there's Project Rocky. We talk a lot about our right to freedom of expression, but we need to talk more about our responsibility to freedom of expression. We don't want to be hurt. 
the depth of knowledge, the difference between speak, speaking up with intention and speaking up with for attention. <coughs> the internet is the super highway for an ID, but online showing empty dollars benefits us all in the health create a safer and better world. We need to communicate online with compassion, consume news with compassion, and click with compassion. Just imagine walking <coughs> a mile in someone else's headlight. I'd like to end on a personal note. In the past nine months, the question I've been asked the most is why, why now? Why was I sticking my head above the paper I pen? You can read between the lines in those questions. And the answer has nothing to do with the politics. The top note answer was, and it's because it's time. Time to stop tiptoeing around my past. Time to stop living the life of Farberine. And time to take back my narrative. It's also not just about saving myself. Anyone who is suffering from shame and public humiliation needs to know one thing. You can survive it. I know it's hard. It may not be painless, quick, or easy, but you can insist on a different ending to your story. Have compassion for yourself. We all deserve compassion and to live both online and off in a more compassionate world. Thank you for listening. Applause. Thank you.